part of this lecture, we'll talk about operational considerations in bioreactors and fermenters. So this is a general layout of your bacterial cultivation process. So you start with a stock culture. So the stock culture is maintained such that there is no mutation. The, the strain, the specific strain of your organism is controlled. It is genotypically uniform for all, all throughout. So your stock culture, you grow your stock, stock culture to create your starter culture. So why do we still need to have a starter culture? So your starter culture, because uh, when you do industrial scale fermentations, you are dealing with tons. This is in the range of tons, kilotons of medium, culture medium. So you, you cannot um, start your fermentation with just a, a spoonful, a loop full of microorganisms. You need to have a certain amount, a certain um, population of microorganisms to start as a starter to start your actual fermentation. So you need to create your starter culture first. So from your stock culture, this is from uh, usually in the laboratory, the, the, the cultures in, uh, kept in the laboratory, you grow this into larger, progressively larger batches until you reach your desired population size. And that is the one that you will pitch in to your um, production or your bioreactor to, in order to produce your product. So these are, um, in your bioreactor, you have several sensors to, faci this is to facilitate proper functioning of your bioreactors. So you have electrodes to facilitate temperature um, measurements, dissolved oxygen content, carbon dioxide content, pH is very important, the, the concentration of metal ions, even the foam levels, bio, um, foam level detections. And sometimes you can also have biosensors to determine the uh, the number, the population of your microorganisms in there. So you have your meters. So basically, you are controlling your airflow or the addition of um, additional um, substrates or even additional um, control elements such as adding additional acids or bases to control your pH. You add um, foam, anti-foam agents, etc. And then transducers to help you detect pressures and liquid flow. So mass spectra, this is usually uh, done with uh, laboratory analysis. So you get samples and then uh, you analyze it in the laboratory. Then you have spectrophotometers, usually seen through biomass determination, uh, the um, optical density measurements. So these are some, uh, what are the considerations, these are the parameters you need to consider in uh, operating bioreactors. So first is pH. So my, most microbial fermentations usually result in acidic cultures as your time progress. So you have your, in your media, you have their buffers. So if you remember in your microbiology when you're preparing culture media, you are using phosphate buffers. In uh, There's a lot of phosphate buffers aside from the, the, the substrate sources. So buffers are important. It helps maintain your pH. So the natural buffers are your phosphates and carbonates. So aside from that, there is always continuous pH monitoring. All throughout the, uh, the fermentation process, usually every day they are monitoring the pH. So sometimes you get a sample. It's either you get a sample from the fermenter each day to test for the pH or you have a pH electrode inside your fermenter as a sensor. So in order to help maintain the pH, you usually add ammonia because again, the pH is decreasing. It's becoming more acidic, so you add bases to control your pH. And then we also uh, consider carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide concentrations in your, uh, uh, in your culture is increasing because carbon dioxide is one of the byproducts of the fermentation. Now, take note, carbon dioxide, when dissolved in water, especially for submerged fermentation, you have uh, carbonic acid. It produces carbonic acid when it is dissolved in water or in liquid medium. And that can also help lower the pH. Although carbonic acid is technically a buffer, but still, it can lower your pH. So there are several ways to determine your carbon dioxide content. So IR absorption, or by checking the effluent gas in a similar manner, sa same principle as gas chrome. Same principle, but not exactly gas chrome. So measurement of thermal conductivity. And then one of the more most important one is oxygen concentration. So if you remember some microorganisms 
are require oxygen, others are uh, killed off in the presence of the oxygen, or some organisms can tolerate oxygen, although they themselves do not uh, really utilize oxygen, or they can only uh, they can only survive in a small amount. They cannot survive without oxygen, but they can only survive on a small concentration of oxygen. So these are different classifications. Obligate aerobes, that means your bioreactor must be constantly supplied by oxygen at a certain concentration or amount. We have facultative anaerobes. These are anaerobic organisms, but they can, um, when oxygen is present, they can utilize oxygen. But when oxygen is absent, they can survive without oxygen. And then you have obligate anaerobes. They are killed off in the presence of, presence of oxygen. You have the aerotolerant anaerobes. So these are uh, anaerobic organisms that doesn't really utilize oxygen, but they are not killed by the presence of oxygen. And then the one that is um, the most delicate, not exactly the most delicate, but uh, microtolerants or rather the microaerophiles, uh, these are the ones that require specific handling because it only needs a certain amount of oxygen at a certain range, so you need to be very precise in the control of the amount of oxygen there. So, several ways to determine oxygen consent in your bioreactor. So, we have the Winkler method. This is laboratory, um, usually done in, uh, usually uh, monitor, laboratory attached the um, processing plant. So, we have the Winkler method that utilizes uh, biological oxygen demand determination. Or you can have polarographic method and gal galvanic method. So, both of them utilizes electrochemical reactions. Uh, using current flow. So sometimes, in, for example, polarographic method, you can use, um, have a sensor inside your fermenter. So this is an example of your uh, oxygen measuring electrode. So the we have your polarographic and you have the galvanic. Galvanic electrode, by the way, is not often used right now because it uses lead although this one is cheaper because it's lead is generally cheaper now for the other one polarographic is technically um, more expensive because again okay, it uses silver chlorides then aside from oxygen you also need to consider pressure or rather maintain pressure in your fermenter so positive pressure is desired inside a reactor because it helps eliminate contamination. So how does it eliminate con uh, contamination? If there's a leak, instead of the because of the positive pressure inside, instead of the contaminants entering, it's more of they're being pushed out. But of course, the content is going outside as well. Um, the control of pressure is very significant, especially if you are maintaining consistent aeration in your bioreactor. So if you are consistently inputting air there, of course, you need to have a pressure gauge. Otherwise, your bioreactor might blow up. So pressure is also, uh, remember, pressure is also important in the uh, solubility of gases. So at higher pressure, your oxygen and other gases are more soluble. The same goes for carbon dioxide. So uh, B, you need to consider that also. So foaming. Foaming is a natural um, process, uh, usually result. Uh, resulting from agitation and aeration. So we have um, foaming, uh, they, uh, the, the, the bioreactor or rather the culture media naturally produces foam. And this is some, most of the time undesirable during a fermentation process. Why? Because first of all, it decreases head space. So you have um, diminished fermentation by around 30 to 45 percent. So if the fermentation produces a lot of foam rapidly, so, you usually reduce your agitation and aeration uh, in order to minimize the formation of foam. And because you're reducing the agitation and aeration, you are decreasing the, uh, the mixing, you are decreasing the supply of the oxygen inside your fermentation. And that leads to, basically, you're asphyxiating your microorganisms inside if it's an obligate aerobes. So if the foam escapes your bioreactor, there's a contamination that can be introduced because of course the foams are on the top, so they, they usually cover. So this is one of the problems there. They cover the uh, the surface of the fermenter. So if uh, so if you are using agitation to introduce gases inside your uh, inside your fermenter, that's also a problem because of course it's covering your the foam is covering the 
the surface, so you cannot um, increase the dissolution of gases. So organic nutrients or inorganic ions in complex organic compounds may be removed from the medium by flow. Aside from that, it also um, it is, has an effect in the mixing. So there is um, improper mixing, there is um, inefficient mixing because sometimes uh, some nutrients, some important metabolites are trapped in the foam, especially if they are differently, differentially attached. So some, some of the um, necessary um, chemicals or metabolites there are uh, trapped in the foam. They have a higher affinity to the uh, to the surface of the foam, so you will have improper mixing and efficient differential um, concentration. So again, fermentation products can be trapped in the foam, leading to actual losses. If your product is um, has a high affinity to the, to the surface of the foam, of course, it's a, it's a major loss. So microorganisms can also be trapped in the foam. So these are the different sometimes um, different foaming patterns. So, of course, this is usually observed um, foam patterns. So, you usually control the, because of the undesirable uh, result of foaming, we, ha we introduce uh, control mechanisms for the foam. So, anti-foams, these are chemical agents to prevent the formation of the foams. So, we also have the foamers. They knock down their physical, um, uh, these are the physical um, implements that knock down foams once they are formed. So you have an anti-foam. So the ideal anti-foam agent should be non-toxic. It has no effect to the taste and the odor if your process or if your product is basically food. It's autoclavable, of course. You do not want to introduce contamination through the um, anti-foam agent that you're adding. So it's not metabolized by the microorganism, leading to undesired products. It does not impair oxygen transfer rate. And it's efficient, cheap, and persistent. So these are some uh, examples of anti-foam. So usually you have natural oils, such as peanuts, oils, and soybean oil. Although when you use peanut oil in food processing, uh, be careful because uh, you need to indicate that you added peanut oil there because of, al uh, well, it can induce allergies. And then you can also have alcohols. So usually uh, heavy or high um, long chain alcohols helps reduce antifoams. You have sorbitant alcohols and its derivatives. You can also have your polyethers and silicones. So these are antifoam agents. So the polyethers and silicones usually they are quite expensive antifoam agents. So how uh, what are the general uh, layout of introducing foam control? So some uh, usually have a probe situated a certain distance above the the line or the surface of the liquid fermentation and when the foam reaches a certain height of course it will be detected by your probe and that probe will um, induce your uh, the anti-foam agent so when the, the foam is detected you have the anti-foam agent that's automatically administered to diminish your uh, the foam in your uh, culture and lastly you have your temperature for temperature you have of course uh, remember your uh, when you remember your energy balance equations as the fermentation goes on you are actually accumulating heat and you need to um, control that because otherwise there is um, there is a possibility of um, we have you harming your microorganisms and especially if your bioreactor uses enzymes. So some enzymes are um, not, or rather, are very susceptible to temperature variations. So sometimes you are exceeding your optimum pH, they might be denatured, something like that. So th these are different temperature control mechanisms. Actually, these are the different jackets. If you remember the parts of the bioreactor, these are the jackets. So we have the the, the annular jacket so you have this is basically a, a second wall around your bioreactor wall where flat water flows around so we can also have a set a certain setup so your water flows um, outside again but through a tube so uh, for the first one in a this is what this one requires a lot of pressure or a consistent pressure 
in order to get to keep the uh, fluid from moving whereas in B it's easier it's easier for the fluid to flow and you have actually adequate control because um, of course your fluid air flows in only a single direction unlike in A there where it disperses when it hits the the annular uh, the, the interior uh, or rather the interface between the first and the second wall now for B this one is more efficient than A why because uh, you can actually control because uh, in A sometimes there are liquid that may be trapped on the bottom or of the top so uh, basically you, there's a little control on the temperature there unlike in B now A and B they, the, the, the temperature control is situated outside of the fermenter or the bioreactor now the good side there is that you would not be you, uh, there's no worries you, you don't have to worry about contamination now for the rest c d and e the uh, the control the coils the control your temperature are switch, switch situated inside this um because of this it might be um you might need to consider the contaminations induced by the flowing liquid cooling uh, the cooling water now However, CDNE also has a faster or a better heat transfer rate than uh, when your uh, cooling water is situated outside your container. So in C, it's a coil inside. In D, you have a coil also serving as a baffle in your reactor. And then in E, you are actually withdrawing the fluid, passing it to a heat exchanger, and then returning it to your culture media. So agitation and aeration is also considered as also a major consideration. So that's why because oxygen is only slightly soluble and you need to introduce agitation for of course mixing. So oxygen is rapidly consumed, so you need to deliver it properly all throughout. So again, mixing is important. So use as for spargers for bubble uh, pneumatic systems, bubble reactors. Uh, if you have spargers, you consider the size of the hole. So the finer the hole, you have a greater mass transfer efficiency. Why? Because uh, you will form smaller bubbles and it has a greater surface area than larger bubbles. So because the, the, the transfer from the air to the, to the air from the air bubble to the liquid media is basically affected largely by the surface area. Of course, the, the higher the surface area, the better. And then um, for mycelial and for fungal fermentation, they usually produce viscous media and it may clog the spargers. So this time, in, uh, since they are viscous, you might need impellers and baffles. So aside, uh, aside from that, you also need to consider the medium. And in considering the medium, you need to consider the composition of your bacteria. So these are the chemical uh, composition. So this is the, uh, the elements by weight. So majority, of course, is um, carbon and uh, oxygen. You also need a certain amount of nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus, and then the rest of the uh, minerals. So in terms of media, of course, um, you have your, uh, depending on the organisms that you have, you, will ha you might need to have organics as a source or it can just be a uh, certain carbon dioxide even you need to consider if your organism is uh, nitrifiers or denitrifiers so these are uh, additional um, uh, additional considerations so carbon source etc now um, aside from that sometimes your strain there are some strains that requires growth factors these are essential metabolites that uh, certain microorganisms required and they they cannot synthesize themselves so you might uh, need to have them present in your culture media so there's vitamins biotin amino acids and fatty acids so all the growth factors is usually present in your carbon and nitrogen sources especially if you use um, as your carbon sources are yeast extract liver extract and blood so oxotrophic growth is strictly reliant on the amount of growth factors and aside from that mineral salts so salts phosphates sulfates so you have uh, they function as meso and macro micronutrients so it, the amount is actually dependent on how, what the product you want on the needs of the organism itself actually depending on your system so your mineral salts can be added analytically based on the amount the mineral content of the ash of the microorganism or synthetic you just um, determined through trial and error 
So, material fermenter construction. So, for non-sterile fermenters, it's usually wood, concrete and steel wood. For example, wooden barrels in um, in your wine production. Even concrete. Concrete usually seen, uh, that is usually concrete made uh, by reactors or fermenters are usually seen in wastewater treatments. And then steel for uh, general some beer production. And then you need to consider sterility. Can you sterilize your fermenter? For example, wood. This is very difficult to sterilize wood. It's actually almost impossible. So your material must be able to withstand sterilization cons uh, conditions such as uh, steel and heat resistant glass like Pyrex. And uh, also you need, uh, sometimes it's not always uh, the sterilization is not done through heat but rather through uh, chemical sterilants. And so your fermenter, the material must be resistant to those sterilants. So you need to consider uh, stainless steel or carbon steel versus the metal uh, metal composition because they might be uh, corroded by your uh, sterilants or your chemical sterilants. So fermentation material can also be dissolved within the media and inhibit your fermentation. So sometimes we use glass coating or plastic, uh, the phenolic epoxy coating to inhibit the uh, fermentation from burrowing inside uh, using the material of your fermenter as other substrate and burrowing, they can sometimes do that. So important, uh, you need to also consider the cost when you upscale. And why upscale? Because again, fermenters, especially for industrial scale fermentation, can go as large as several tall, uh, how, large how can be as large as a house, a three-story house. So you need to consider that. So, joints and seams must be welded together smoothly to prevent packets or any old media can remain, and that is also a source of contamination. So, that's it for several, the considerations of bacterial, uh, of general considerations for fermentations. So, again, um, these are the generalized criteria, but depending on the, the system you want, the, the microorganism you have, the product that you wanted to produce, uh, you need to tailor these considerations to the needs of your system. So that's all.